Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Ely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're a couple guys talking about some stuff. The stuff we are talking about now is world religions. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the intro week last week. This week we'll be talking about Islam. Yeah, I'm excited. Excited to do this. And I guess, you know, I was thinking, I feel like we have to give a disclaimer in, in terms of like, neither of us have like, spent years studying other religions or whatever and so if you're Very like true. hey you you know some muslims believe this it's like look we're going to do general overviews we're going to do general beliefs we understand that there's you know you will talk about it like even in islam there's like two i don't know what do you call them i mean it's the christian equivalent almost of denominations, denominations. even though muslims would argue yes that they're yeah we just want to say we're not scholars on this. We're giving overviews. Uh, mainly what we want to do, uh, essentially, is compare why, uh, what are the claims of Christianity compared to whatever religion, and why is it that the Christianity is the only way, as we said last week, up the mountain, mm-hmm. the, the only path that leads to up the mountain to heaven to God, whatever you want to say. And right. So that's what we're generally going to talk about. And yeah. so, look, guys, we skimmed the Wikipedia page on Islam. I don't know what more you could ask from <laughs> us, you know? So come on. I mean, our job is not full time podcasters, okay? So, uh, unless yeah. you want to start donating, then yeah, maybe unless, we can make know. that happen. Yeah. Uh, but before we get into Islam, we want to start with the life hack of the month. You got one? I do. All right. You, you, you want to kick us off? Okay, I'll all kick right, you off. Right. Okay. So, uh, you know, we had some work done on our house a couple months ago, and we're really happy, and then found some things uh, that I, I wasn't so happy about with some, some of our hardwoods and stuff. And so I tried to reach out to the contractor for a while, for three weeks, no response. Uh, so I was texting, I was calling, seemed to be getting ghosted. Uh, and then I sent a final text that said, hey, I've been reaching out for three weeks, and I want to let you know I'm going to change my Google review uh, if, if you don't respond to me. He responded within a minute that he had been out of town. He was at my house within an hour, and then the workers came a few days later to correct the repairs. So, you know, I, don't be a jerk about it, but my life hack of the month is, as a consumer, you do have the power of the Internet is in you your do. hand. And you and it. Use it not, you know, not like a jerk, but I I felt good about what I did because before I went nuclear, I like I gave him three weeks, and then before even like changing the review, I like warned him I was going to do it to give him the chance to fix it, and he did. So, and I'll add on to that life hack and say it does not usually work for doctors' offices because I have tried. <laughs> they do not care about the one star reviews. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it, it's going to depend com- on the industry. Yeah, because those insurance companies are going to pay them that money. Yeah, it anyways, don't matter. So. Yeah. So yeah, my life hack of the month is leverage your Google review. Yeah. What do you got? So mine is so if you know me personally, you know I kind of have stomach issues, and I've had a lot recently. Right. And so what I want to say before I say this is listen to your doctor, uh, but understand that there's kind of like an Eastern and a Western way to think about it. And, you know, mm. Western medicine is very just like Medicaid. You know, here's... Take a pill. Yep. I, I don't know exactly what's wrong, but I looked up some natural remedies as well as taking the, the, the medicine. Right. And both were helpful. And so I just wanted to share, uh, you know, in the past I've shared the pomegranate juice about the acid reflux. And I've gotten some feedback from people that have, have used it's, it. Yeah. It's helped. Yeah. It's really helped me. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add on to that and okay. give some more. So it, it turns out... Uh, for like stuff like inflammation in the stomach and to preventative measures for it, green tea and honey is really helpful. Okay. And so I started drinking that not every day for, so when I, when it was really bad, I drank it every day and and I felt better. Um, I drink it now, uh, uh, you know, a couple times a week just to keep it up. But apparently honey is like a superfood. And it's been like a consistent one. You know, it keeps changing. It used to be kale. It used to be whatever. Yeah, whatever. But I found something. So I'm not saying do this. I'm saying do your research on this. I found something called Manuka honey, M-A-N-U-K-A. It's very expensive, only from New Zealand. But they've done some scientific tests on it that it'll kill, like, bad bacteria in your stomach mm. and stuff. And I'll tell you what. Once I started taking that, it's very expensive. So, like, 10 ounces of it. So a tiny bottle. 
uh, like half the size of a coffee mug is like forty dollars. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Very expensive. Yep. Um, took one spoonful of it. I felt some like a burning sensation in my stomach, like not painful, but just like there. Mm-hmm. Man, by the next morning, I felt great. Wow. So, anecdotal. Listen to your doctor. I'm not saying this is like don't go to the doctor. I'm just saying do your if you're having trouble uh, finding a remedy to your stomach pain and stuff. Um, man, this thing has amazing reviews in terms of like antibiotics wouldn't work this wouldn't work this wouldn't work took the honey for 14 days my problem was gone man and uh, i'm not completely there yet but i will say it i don't know if it's the medicine i don't know if it's the natural remedies but since i've started doing it i felt great there's something about honey yeah you know well that's awesome um good life hack yeah so let's get into Islam. So we, we covered it all, you know, spiritual health, yeah. emotional health, yeah. physical health. This is your one-stop shop for podcast, <laughs> and it's election season, so you know oh, politics. Uh, get ready, okay? Buckle up. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Islam today. Uh, a few different sources we have: uh, ten things every Christian should know about Islam from Zane Pratt on the Gospel Coalition. Nine things every Christian should know. So by Joe Carter. So then I don't know what the things. one thing. Yeah. And then eight. <laughs> then Don Carson, Doug Sweeney, and Harold Netlin wrote an article for the Gospel Coalition called The Message of Islam versus the Gospel of Jesus. So recurring theme of the Gospel Coalition. And then we have an article from the BBC. Right. And we will publish all those in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, these, all this stuff, I want to give, you know, verbal credit. At not coming from us. Sure. You know? uh, we're looking at sources. So in this series... We're going to ask seven questions of each religion to kind of compare and contrast. Um, What does this religion teach about God, sin, salvation, Scripture, Jesus, discipleship, and the afterlife? And then we're going to point out some points on um, how you can, you know, witness to this faith. Uh, So first, what does this religion teach about God? It's really interesting um, in the message of Islam versus the Gospel of Jesus article. uh, They point out, you know, both Muslims and Christians affirm there's one God who's the creator of all things that exist. Um, And we'd agree, Muslims and Christians, about some divine attributes, but like very different in our belief on like really who God is, like the nature of God, yeah, and what he expects from mankind. So, like, Muslims believe God is sovereign, merciful, benevolent, but they would not say God is love. And this mm. is something we talked about last week, you know. Yeah. For you to be able to say that, you have to believe for the Trinity. The Trinity. Yeah. And Muslims are going to hold to there's one God. One person. One God. One God, one person. Yes. They or, would accuse Christians of being polytheist, basically. Right. Um, we said, no, 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 we're, we believe in one God in three persons. Yeah. yeah. And the idea of you know God in love sending his son to forgive the sins of the world is not something they would um, agree with. So the Quran never identifies God with love, which is really interesting reality to me. Yeah. And it doesn't command us to love God. Yeah, because totally it's, different dynamic. It's right? like a, it's it's a lot, and we'll talk about this later. But it a lot, it has a lot to do with obedience and righteousness, right? right. That's like the main thrust, yeah, of of the Quran. Uh, it's uh, who was the theologian? J. I. Packer, I think, said like the most fundamental Christian truth is God is Father. Hmm. So something like that. So that is not the concept. Muslims have of God, and they would even say that talk of God as love compromises his sovereignty. So they'd say hmm. this humanizes him. Um, yeah. So uh, th- that's kind of th- their view of God, very sovereign, yeah. not a God of love. So it- it's funny, you know, two attributes of God that in the Christian, as Christians we would believe, is that God is transcendent, right? That he's yep. bigger than us, he's sovereign, he's out there almost you know he's ununderstandable but he's also imminent he's here he's with us he loves us right and it sounds like to me it muslims believe in a very transcendent god yep. but not an imminent god i think that's a very fair point and, and I, i'll point out this too this is something in seminary i thought was interesting is that you know allah is the word for god in right. islam but the hebrew word for god is elohim right it's the and it's the same root word 
A L L and E L L, right? Hebrew this, and Arabic, yeah. But it, it's interesting to point out that as Christians, we would still say it's not the same God. Just look at the description of the right. God in the, you right. know, and it's like this interesting thing that it's a similar root word mm-hmm. for God, right? Um, but not describing the same God. Yeah. 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 I, I think that is an important distinction. Do Jews and Christians worship the same God? No, we don't. Um, Muslims. Yeah. Dude, I said Jews. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about a future week already. <laughs> right. I'm already, I'm writing the script for next week while I'm <laughs> recording this podcast. Yes. Be impressed by me. Apparently, side note, Charles Spurgeon, while he was preaching, would actually actively pray for members of his congregation that he was looking at as he was preaching to. Man, amazing. And members of Christ Fellowship Church, I want you to know, I love you dearly, but I do not do that because I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you How do you do that? that? Yeah. Um, all right, second question. What does this religion teach about sin? Now, this is a really interesting difference between Islam and Christianity. In the 10 Things You Should Know About Islam article, Islam, there's a quote, Islam teaches that humans are born spiritually neutral, perfectly capable of obeying God's requirements completely, and that they remain this way even after they personally sin. Uh, And this actually is going to go into our next question, what does this religion teach about salvation? Continuing the quote, the need of humanity, therefore, is not salvation, but instruction. Hence, Islam has prophets, but no savior. You know, I I had this, uh, I took a religion 101 class at at Georgia, and um, my professor, I think, was actually Muslim. He was a white guy that I I think was a Muslim convert. And he, he, his whole thing was, yeah, Adam and Eve in the garden, when they ate the fruit, it's not that they disobeyed, they just forgot the command. This is a very, very passive view of sin, hmm. interestingly enough, in the Islamic tradition. Um, whereas uh, Christian Christianity would teach depravity, that we are born with a bent towards sin, yeah. and that sin infects and affects all of us. Yeah. Uh, but Islam's teaching is more, more neutral, uh, more about forgetting, uh, so we need instruction, not salvation. You, you know, that— it makes sense too. So there's a book called uh, "Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus." I, man, it's been on my list for a long time. I've it's, heard it's, it's a great, great book. Uh, it's about um, Nabil Qureshi, who was a Muslim and converted to Christianity. And his journey on how he got there, mm-hmm. and one of the main differences that he he says is that in the Western culture we live in what's called a guilt innocence cu- culture. So mm-hmm. like the idea of fairness is like really important. Right and wrong is really important. Mm-hmm. And Muslims believe in what's an honor shame culture, right? So it's not. So it's like it's almost like che- like cheating or breaking the law is fine as long as you still bring honor to your family. Sure, sure. And what is actually bad is bringing dishonor to your family, mm-hmm. not necessarily sin. And and I'm like, you know, it's interesting to think about that. It's actually pretty congruent with the teachings of Islam, and I didn't realize that that the honor shame culture f- fits in well with. Uh, the the idea of sin. Yep. Because it doesn't really matter if you break the rules, break the law, as long as you bring honor to... Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, that ties into what does the religion teach about salvation? We don't really need to be saved. We need to be instructed. Right. And we're capable of doing that. We're, we're able to produce the good deeds that this religion requires if we just are instructed the right way. And it's interesting to think about because when we think about Adam and Eve as Christians, they were the only ones that we, we would say were capable of obedience of, of God. Right. Whereas after that, uh, Adam means sinned, we have the idea of federal headship that Mm -hmm. because of Adam's sin, or this is Romans five, because of Adam's sin, now all sin. And because of, Jesus, who is the new Adam, those who are under him now are able to, in the, in the Holy Spirit, obey God. And right, yeah, very different view. And that teaching on federal headship is brought to you by one of our former listeners of the month, Jonathan Wisdom, one of our favorite Presbyterians. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jonathan, for listening. Uh, Presbyterians love them some federal headship. So yeah, this, next- is my, this is my PCA training, <laughs> right? Right. Out. Yeah. Uh, what does this religion teach about Scripture? So the most important text in the Islamic faith is the Quran, which literally means the recitation. 
And again, we, we've talked about this uh, last week, I think. Unlike Christianity, which teaches that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but was like written through the personalities of the authors. Right. Uh, Muslims believe that this was, I mean, given straight from the a- angel Gabriel to Muhammad while he was in like a trance-like state. Mm. It occurred over a gradual period of 23 years, concluding in Muhammad's death. Um, and a number of his companions who knew the Quran by heart uh, collected it into a book uh, so that it could be preserved. So the, the chapters in the Quran are called surahs, and the verses are called ayahs. <laughs> I think I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, so different understanding of like how the scripture came to be yes. from Islam to Christianity. I- I will say something just to point out as listeners of this podcast is many of these religions, they've got their book or whatever from an angel speaking directly to someone in a trance. Demon, maybe? You know, there's a theory. I mean, honestly, yeah. There's a theory that— that it could that could have happened, but right? It was actually a, a demon and yeah, you know, doing it for, um, for sure. And and it is interesting too how like w- with you see with Christianity, just the like early manuscript evidence, um, and just the multiplication of manuscripts, like crazy right. of like the New Testament letters, the careful detailed preservation of Old Testament text, um by the scribes, you know, and you, you see something different with, uh, the Quran. You see a revelation coming to one guy, Muhammad, uh, over a 23 year period. Uh, and then people hearing his recitations and then eventually writing them down later, uh, to collect it into the Quran versus scripture, you know, uh, over 60 books by over 40 authors over over a 1500 year period um with very detailed um like telling one story yeah yeah when they discovered the dead sea scrolls you know decades ago they were able to compare a copy of isaiah uh from like later other manuscript traditions right and it was like the exact Exact same same. yeah you know Um, yeah you know i think in some ways it's like brilliant of God to do it this way because for the Christian scriptures because that's th- that's like such good evidence to me. Mm-hmm. It's not one person; it's 40, 40 authors yep. are saying the same thing. Yep. Right, hearing from God. Right, because yep. like in a sense, like one person, yeah, can hear from God. Sure, right? but you can also make that up. Right, right, and you can make that claim. Yeah, making it up. Right, but forty over forty people, sixty six books. It's just fifteen hundred years. Yeah, it's, three different languages, three different continents. I mean. Come yeah, on. yeah, it, and it's like you know I always say. I mean, to quote our president, "Come on, man, come on." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and it, you know I, I always ask this question because some people are like, "Oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can believe in the scriptures because it was written by man." And it, you know, maybe I said this last week, but I'm like, really, you? If it floated down from the sky, you would think it. You sure. Would believe it more? I'm like, no. Like the fact that it was written by forty authors. 66 books over 1500 years all saying the same thing i'm like that that's really convincing to mm-hmm. me so yeah. yeah and this was an interesting thing pointed out by joe carter in his um nine things article for a believing muslim the quran almost occupies the position of christ for christians interesting so th- it's almost like uh like the the Quran occupies a, a very unique special place, and so you shouldn't handle the text unless you're in a state of like ritual purity, mm, you know. Yeah. And so, like even touching the Quran has implications. You got to make sure you you've cleansed yourself. So, uh, it, it's definitely not a one to one equivalent. Christians how they view the Bible, Muslims how they view the the Quran. Um, and then there's also hadiths, right? Which yes. is something different. Yeah. So it's. Um the hadith is, I think, sayings. It's like sayings of Muhammad, and it isn't like the same level as the Quran, uh, but it's like a book that Muslims also read for wisdom and sh- instruction, like we talked about. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they have it, it. You know, we have the Bible, 
Mm-hmm. But it re- but Muslims have the Quran and the Hadith. Right. Right. And so that's just something that's a little different that just to know as well. Right. For sure. Uh, another interesting thing, the Muslim view of the Christian Bible. Uh, so they believe the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels were revelations from Allah, but that they've been distorted and corrupted. And we'll get into a little bit more of this on what they think of Jesus. But— um, they they believe he's a he was a Muslim prophet, but they don't believe he was the son of God. They also don't believe he was crucified or resurrected. Right. But ironically, this is so interesting. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. They do believe he's the one that comes back at the end of time. That it's Jesus, Jesus that yeah. comes back. You know, and I think it's re- remember to uh, talk about too um, that there are some like streams that are related, right? Because they would trace their lineage back to Abraham as well, right? Right, so a, a good tie-in there. So Islam would be branched under you know, what's called the monotheistic faith or the Abrahamic faith, so Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. But they also have like a very different uh, interpretation of like, you read your Old Testament, you read Genesis and stories about Abraham— and their stories are a bit different. And yeah. Ishmael is going to feature much more prominently not and differently, Isaac. not Isaac. Yeah. You know? So it, it's interesting. Like uh, They believe that he went with his son Ishmael to, to build the Kaaba in Mecca, which is that big like black box mm. in, in Mecca, um, to worship Allah. So very different things going on. Um, in the like, if, My understanding is if you read the Quran— um, the longer you read, the the more differences in the stories that there are. Sure. So, um, next question: What does this uh, religion, what does Islam teach about Jesus? Uh, so, in the Ten Things article, point out uh, it affirms Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed many mighty miracles, and that he will come again at the end of history. It even calls him the Word of God. Hmm. That that's just so interesting. Yeah, uh, and and in Arabic, Jesus is Isa, um, but it denies uh, his deity. They don't believe he's the Son of God. Uh, they think that title is blasphemous, um, and in the majority view, it they deny that he died on the cross. I think they believe yeah. that he switched places <laughs> with Judas, like at the last moment, like yeah. um, because they don't. They, again, honor shame. How could God ever allow yep. a prophet to die a death like that? Like yep. it's it's unthinkable, right, uh, to them, and therefore they don't believe that he he raised from the dead, but they think he was raised up to heaven without tasting death. So kind of like we would hold Enoch and Elijah, yep. similar kind of thing, um, and they don't believe in the possibility of substitutionary <clears throat> atonement. Um, so it it is interesting because. Most Muslims have a very high regard for Jesus, uh, but not not not, not, as, God, not as God, not as Savior. Right. But um, yeah, yeah. I think something here too is that they deny Christ as the Son of God, and something that was in the seeking Allah, finding Jesus thing that was pointed out that I thought was really interesting is, as you talk to a Muslim about it. That term son of God is is not helpful. You want to point them to when Jesus calls himself the son of man. Um, mm. Because the son of man calls back to Daniel 7. And that description of the son right. of man is God. Yep. And uh, Jesus constantly calls himself. Yes. He calls his, the, his disciples the sons of God. Yep. But he constantly calls himself the son of man. Yeah. And that's kind of like the evidence that Jesus is calling himself God. Right. Um, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting going through Mark now. You know, it, it's... It's his favorite title for himself, Son of Man. Yeah. And it's only used by him. No one else ever calls him that. He calls himself that. Yeah, interesting. And yeah, Daniel 7, it is clear the Son of Man is someone who has been given authority by the Ancient of Days to rule all things. You know, yeah. it definitely a claim to deity. Uh, next question, what does Islam teach about discipleship? Meaning, if you're Muslim, how do you live out the Muslim life? Yeah. So the very word Islam itself means submission. So a Muslim is someone who submits to God. Um, and you should do this based on the teachings of Muhammad. 
the Islamic creed is there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. So they got two main problems with Christianity. One, they'd say we have three gods. Right. And we deny Muhammad as his prophet. So it's really interesting. I mean, you've probably heard different news articles over the years. Of I think a couple of years ago there was a cartoon artist in uh, Europe that made kind of satirical comics of Muhammad. Yeah. And that was not okay. Yeah. I mean, I, he was met with violence, if I remember correctly. Yeah. South South Park did it too, and uh, <laughs> there was freaking out that that happened. Yeah. They... <laughs> South Park's, I would guess, was much worse. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, yes, South Park is an equal opportunity offender. You know, <laughs> they you are at least that. Um, the The main way to live the Muslim faith, though, is the five pillars of Islam. Mm. So you have the confession of faith. There's no god but God, and Muhammad is prophet. You have prayer. So ritual prayers that are supposed to be said in Arabic five times a day, facing Mecca, uh, performed in prescribed sets of bowing, kneeling, prostration. You have alms giving to the poor, which is taken as a tax in officially Islamic countries. You have fasting uh, during the month of Ramadan. You fast sun up to sunset. Uh, and then you have a pilgrimage, the Hajj, which is a, a trip to Mecca that every Muslim believer should make once in their lifetime if they can. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of the main like structure of the faith, five pillars of Islam. Um, Two main, you could call them denominations or sects, you have Sunni and Shia. Uh, Sunnis are the vast majority, 85% of them. Uh, the split occurred uh, the generation after Muhammad's death based upon who should succeed him. Um, so the Shia tack on an additional sentence to the creed, there's no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. They add... Um, and Ali is the friend of Allah, who was supposed to be, who was the cousin of Muhammad. So they would believe that the, like, successor follows that kind of family lineage. Hmm. Um, that's the Shia, and the uh, Sunni don't. So th that's kind of the split on, like, who should be, like, the head of the faith kind of thing. You know, the interesting thing to me about that is— so one of the Muslim claims is like the Quran is God's word and has never been changed. But then we see immediately after the death of Muhammad, it changes immediately. Right. And and you also have, I, I think, a lot of um, a lot of Muslims would kind of point to Christians and be like, look how divided you are in your denominations. Islam is united. And it's like, well, not, not really. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, there, there are some significant divisions. Um, and then I think there's even another sect. I'm trying to remember— way back when to my religion 101 class, there is a more mystical uh, sect of Islam that doesn't quite fit either into the mm. Shia or Sunni. Yeah. Um, but once again, this this goes back to the honor-shame thing because mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like it's okay if it's illogical as long as you're not dishonoring. Okay, right? yeah. And so even the teaching of like the kids, and I'm getting a lot of this from Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Right. Uh, but it's like you can't even question the elders when there comes like logical fallacies. Just sure. Listen. Sure. Um, you know, and, and I, I, th I found that interesting. That's how it's passed down. Right. It's right. This honor shame thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, so you got the Shias, uh, who believe the office should only be passed down to the descendants of Muhammad, the office of Caliph. And you have the, uh, Sunnis who, uh, would disagree. Um, and, you know, so it's interesting. So, like, Iran is prom predominantly Shia, and Saudi Arabia and most other Arab countries are Sunni. So you, you see, like, tensions, you know, um, that erupt even in, in the Middle East. Yeah. So um, there's also Sharia law, and this, mm. this gets a lot of, you know, kind of coverage in, in America. I think people get— it, easy to get confused about this. So this is the moral code and religious law of Islam's of Islam. Um, two primary sources, the precepts in the Quranic verses and the examples set by Muhammad in the Sunnah. 
Um, there's also different grades or classification of Sharia. So there's obligatory, there's recommended, there's neutral, there's discouraged, and there's forbidden. So every human action belongs to one of the five categories. And uh, most Muslim countries adopt a few aspects of Sharia while a few countries apply the entire code. Okay. So there's also variation there. Um, and we were talking about, and this is like pretty interesting too, like the Muslim, like the like Islamic faith might be the most like intense about their views on like women's rights and homosexuality. And that ties into this, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's really interesting that at least in America today, you know, Christians are the homophobic anti-women group. Bigots. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but Muslims get like a free pass. And really some of this goes down to like critical theory and how uh, like minority oppressed statuses change everything. Right. So according to kind of critical theory, like Muslims are still like an oppressed group, so right. to speak. And so they're allowed a free pass. We don't need to worry about them. They're they're like on our side in how we view the world, and even though their views on homosexuals and women are like way, way, way more, more extreme. radical and yeah. extreme than Christians ever are. Um, so it's just interesting how Pretty interesting viewpoint in yeah. our culture, in this cultural moment, and we're only twenty years past nine eleven, right? But in this cultural moment, um. Christians are considered like a grave threat to our culture, right? But Muslims are not. It, it comes back to the, I mean, the neo-Marxist stuff because sure. Marxist in the past hundred years, Christianity is the enemy of the state. Yes, uh, and so it really comes back to that a lot too. Yep. Even, even though, once again, it's Islam's just, view is right. more extreme. I mean, you just think about. I mean, there's still honor killings that happen. You know, it's, it's crazy and today. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's crazy. So, um, and you know, it, it is an interesting and is a worthy aside. There's at least since nine 11 has been the debate. Is Islam a religion of peace? Right. And it's like, well, it depends on who you ask and what you read and how you define that context. Yeah. Because there's some stuff, I mean, you were looking it up before we press record, there's some some stuff in the Quran that's like, wow, that's that's pretty violent. Yeah, I mean, like you know? straight up commands, just commands that say you should like commit violence against the right. non-believers, right, the infidels. And and when you look at the life of Muhammad, I mean, you uh, there there's some sketchy, violent. Yeah, you want? I here's what I invite you to do. Read up on the life of Muhammad about how he treated women and read up on the life of Jesus on how he treated women. And you can decide for yeah. yourself, uh, drastic, drastic difference. Um, and it, very violent person. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's that interesting. You'd have people that says, no, I mean, Islam really teaches violence. Yeah. And then you have some Islamic teachers that would say, no, you're misinterpreting the yes. Quran. Yeah. Um, but you, you certainly there's, see radicalism. I mean, you use radicalism in every religion, but you certainly see it in Islam. Absolutely. And, and so we just want to say, like, obviously there are people who misuse and abuse the belief sure. for their own gain. Yep. You see that in Christianity. You see that in yep. Islam. You know, you see that in all sorts of belief systems and mm -hmm. world religions. So there's always extremists that everyone would like be like, they're not part of us. Yep. Um, but I think Islam has particularly some statements in the Quran that um, are seemingly condoning violence. Sure. I'm not saying terrorist acts. Yep. I'm just saying violence. Yep. And so, um, you know, once again, we're not scholars, so there could be some context we're missing here or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's in there and it's, worthwhile to have that discussion i yeah i think the fairest way to um evaluate these things is not um does your religion have extremist well yeah of okay course. so yeah. um but like what did your founder teach and how did your founder live mm. 
And so when you're talking about extremism, uh, look at the life of Muhammad and compare it to the life of Jesus, and right. you will find two radically different people. And I, I think that I think that is totally fair game, right. you know. Um, and so, yeah, I think w- worthy discussion. Last question: What does this religion teach about the afterlife? By the way, did we cover the salvation thing? We might have. We did. Yeah, no, no uh, salvation, just, just instruction. Yeah, really. Just, yeah. Um, yeah. The good and bad thing. Did we talk about? That? That's what. That's what. Is, is that this? That's where we're coming. Oh, okay. You're so excited. I am. I just, I was, I'm like, did I not pay attention and we talked about that or are we about to talk about that? Were you also planning next week's podcast in your head (laughs) while we were recording this podcast? Um, Essentially, uh, Islam teaches that at the end of time, everyone will be judged. If you've done more good than bad, you will go to Jannah or paradise. Uh, If you've done more bad than good, you go to Jahannam, which is hell, a place of physical and spiritual suffering. Heaven or paradise is described as a garden of eternal bliss and a home of peace. Um, so it's all based on works. Uh, so your works are weighed. You know, you hate to be that guy that missed heaven by one deed, but apparently that's the way it'll work, you know? Um, <laughs> Man, could you even imagine? Man, that would be unfortunate. Um, so they do believe in Allah as a, like, they believe he, like, forgives sin or whatever. Like, they, they do believe in, like, forgiveness, um, that he is compassionate and merciful. So not all bad actions will be punished. Um, but they do believe in an unforgivable sin, uh, the sin of shirk, which is regarding anything equal as Allah, which I guess maybe you could argue they believe Christians, they probably believe Christians are guilty of that. Yeah, to, of believing Jesus is right. yeah. equal to God. So, yeah, that's that's the afterlife. Um, so that's kind of Islam in a nutshell. Um, we kind of want to conclude with just maybe important thoughts on witnessing two Muslims. Yeah. Um, anything that comes to your mind? Yeah, I have a few. So I, I've been able to witness to uh, multiple Muslims. Um, never personally led a Muslim to faith, um, mm-hmm. but you know, first of all, understanding honor shame is really sure. important, especially if you are a Westerner, which I would guess almost all of you are who are listening. I mean, we're an international podcast, so I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, understanding the difference between guilt, innocence culture and honor shame culture will help you a lot in your language and how to speak to mm-hmm. um, Muslims and what is important to them because you're talking about certain things like sin. It makes means something totally different. Yep. But I, I would say... The thing that I've come back to that's, I don't know, like, that's really gotten my Muslim friends to think um, is the idea of justice. Mm. Because if, because I think inherent to every human is this idea that of justice, Mm -hmm. but Islam's view of sin and salvation completely throws out, in my opinion, justice. Yeah. Because uh, what I always say is good actions never erase bad actions. Right. And so that action still must be accounted for, right? Right. Like if someone robs a store just because you help a grandma across the street a hundred times doesn't mean mm-hmm. you didn't rob that store. You yep. still, someone still needs to pay for that yep. if there's justice in the world. Yeah. Uh, I think in the Christianity, you have this like beautiful picture of justice and love, like perfectly. Yep. Whereas I think the idea of justice is kind of lacking here mm-hmm. because... If even if you weigh good things and bad things, if you forgive bad actions without punishment, that's that's unjust. Yep, yep. No, I I think right? you're spot on. And yep. so I, I think coming to here is, you know, I think a lot of times as you talk, it's like we're not attacking anyone. We're not like forcing anyone to believe. Like we're not trying to like stump people or act smarter but I, I think it as we come down to it i always lead the conversation to this idea of sin and justice yeah yeah that's good um you know i a, a few thoughts on my end i something i appreciate about muslims are they are a people of a book yeah um and 
they they believe in uh, all powerful God. Yeah, and they believe in a scripture that binds them to a certain way to live. Yeah, and uh, in a world in a very like postmodern Western world that kind of seems to make up rules as we go and doesn't really believe in a transcendent anything. That's actually a great place to be able to start. Um, and I, I would much rather have a spiritual conversation with a Muslim <laughs> than an average American. Yeah. Uh, not saying you can't be American or Muslim, just so you don't send me an email. Um, but, you know, in, in general, a cultural Christian yeah. uh, American. I think there's a lot of respect there. Much but, rather, yeah. And, and especially with, I mean— the Muslims I've known are some of the most disciplined people I know. Yeah. Right? If you actually follow that five-fold path, yeah. there's something to respect about the discipline. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, the five pillars. I'm um, sorry, the five pillars. Yeah. Also, you're, you're going two weeks ahead yeah. to Buddhism. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, I've in the Muslims I've interacted with locally and overseas have generally tended to um, be eager to have spiritual conversations. Yeah. Uh, which I find most yeah, like I, yeah. kind of cultural Christians really don't. They don't. Yeah, want to Yeah, that's do a it. great point. Uh, a great thing that I was taught uh, as a great conversation starting point is the first surah in the Quran. Um, they consider this to be the perfect embodiment of Islam. They recite this daily in their prayers, and uh, one of the things it says is, uh, "We do worship and." We do worship, and from you alone we do seek assistance. Guide us to the right path, the path of those to whom you have granted blessing. Uh, and one of the things I was taught is to say, you know, I just, that first, sir, what do you think the right path is? Mm. And uh, opening up that conversation on on their turf, you're, you're playing on their turf at that point. You're right. quoting their book. And then, then you go into, you know, I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Is a helpful—I had a—years ago, um, I had a conversation with a Muslim guy in a gas station. <laughs> uh, and I brought that up, and he's like, all you white people love that first surah. I'm like, he must have had other people that took the training that I did that had, <laughs> you know, used that on. Um, <laughs> but the other thing I'd, I'd encourage, too, is because Muslims have a high view— uh, of Jesus, uh, talk about Jesus, offer to read the gospels with them. Yeah. Um, talk, talk about the life of Jesus, I, I think is the, and then be, be willing to compare what does the Bible say about Jesus with what does the Quran say about right. Jesus? Uh, because it is, it's very different. Yeah. Uh, but they come with a high regard for him. So, you know, start with Jesus and with Jesus, you yeah. never lose that way. And at the end of the day, just remember, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work, you know, and absolutely, no matter what arguments you throw out there without the transformation of the Holy Spirit, all you're doing is planting seeds, which is yep. great. Yeah, it's great to plant seeds. Yeah. But just to remember that. Yeah. So. And I, and I think like, and again, it's been 20 years um, from, from 9-11, but, you know, they're— there have been a lot of um, there's plenty of anti-Muslim rhetoric to go around in our our country, and uh, we need to love our Muslim neighbors, not be afraid of our Muslim neighbors. Sure. So uh, you know, I think that that people can sense the disposition you have toward them. Yeah. Um, and so uh, they are people lost in need of salvation through Christ, and we have the answer. Uh, for the human longing for justice and forgiveness and yeah. cleansing. And we have the answer for how their shame can be removed and um, how Jesus took our shame and gave us the honor that he deserved and uh, so much and took our guilt and gave us the innocence that we didn't deserve, you know? Yeah. So a lot of good stuff, but hope, hope this podcast was helpful to you. And we look forward to continuing our series next week.